Hi, my name is Brittany Dupree, and this is Compassionate Las Vegas, the podcast. Well, Brittany, welcome to the podcast. I am so glad to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have an amazing conversation. Well, your story was so touching that I said, this is what Las Vegas needs to hear right now. The work that you are doing is incredible and so needed in this moment. So where I'd like to start our conversation today is just let's catch everyone up to where you are today. What are you doing each and every day in Las Vegas? Each and every day in Las Vegas. So my role um, each and every day in Las Vegas, my professional role is I am the director of individual um, and foundation partnerships for Teach for America Las Vegas. Uh, It's a nonprofit, it's a national nonprofit, and we have a local region here. And we recruit, hire, and train high qualified teachers to come into our most at-risk schools and teach for two years and work with them to start to really see our education system and where they can actually create impactful change to make sure that every child has the access to to experience and education that will give them the future that they deserve to have. And so that essentially is my role right now. Um, And I work from home because we're in this virtual world now, which has been a shift, but I love what I do. And I am a firm believer that Education is the key to bright futures and really is the key to breaking down generational poverty. And so um, that's why I do what I do. I absolutely agree with what you just said. It is so key. And I saw a stat, and you probably know this better than me, but for every year of education a woman receives, it's like a 20% increase in income when you're dealing with like overseas populations. So yeah. I thought that that was like mind blowing. How important. Absolutely. And you know, I will say that when I was in, when I was a kid, when I was in high school, I did not take school seriously. I was not a good student. I was way more went to school for like the social aspect. I was like the social butterfly. I just wanted well, to be seen. And, up. Right, right. Like, um, which is actually has done well in my career. But um, it wasn't until, and I'll kind of get to the, the uh, why, but until I went to college that I realized, oh, I have to take this seriously if I want to have a future to be able to provide for myself and, and you know, uh, build the kind of life that, that I, I want. And I went on to finish my, my uh, master's degree. And everyone in my family always jokes that I was like the last person who they ever thought would go on to finish her master's. But my education has been the key. Um, like foundation for my career and my being able to build upon my, my career. And so I always tell people like, if I didn't get my master's degree, I wouldn't be able to do so many things. That's, that's so true. And education comes in so many different ways. I want to get into the Teach for America program in just a bit, but before we do, I kind of want to do a little level setting here sure. and understand how you define compassion. Gosh, I, it's so interesting because I knew that you were going to ask me that. And I've been thinking about it for a few days now. And I define compassion as love. I, can, I uh, define compassion as love and kindness and patience and being able to understand someone else's situation, but not only understand it, but also being driven to take action to make it better. Mm-hmm. And so I think that we can, we can sit around and feel bad for people all day long or, you know, see something that makes us sad. But I think the other part of compassion is saying, okay, I don't like that. And now I'm going to do something about that. And I think that action is, um, is compassion. So I think compassion is like a culmination of different things. But in, in my world, um, I can have sympathy. but. Uh, if I don't take action, I don't think I'm necessarily compassionate. Yeah. So that's how I define it. 
I, I, I'm a love guy. I don't know if it's showing on the screen, but I have a picture with love just written at the top um, on my bookshelf. And so love is compassion. I think that that definitely going to tweet that out. Yes, I think love is compassion. And I, I also think that um, I believe that that the, the biggest, the most important thing that we have in life is the connection between human beings. And I also think that that's the thing that we're missing. Yeah. in the world right now in so many ways we're very divided and it's very um uh polarizing right now everything feels not only connection like with coronavirus and everything that's going on but politically just we're in this state of i think people are having a hard time finding that connection piece and i don't think we as humans can actually survive without that and so um and I think that it takes compassion to be able to connect with, with people on a real level. So, and it takes love. It takes exactly. that ability to be open to love and diversity and all of those things. Yeah. And connection really is, I think, the key to exercising compassion. And that's, I think, the difference between that sympathy and empathy and drives you to compassion is when you actually feel that connection. Absolutely. One of the things that I, I try to get people to see is like, there are no others. I always use when in my writings, other self, because I want you to know, like you and me aren't really separate. This is just some illusion we've made up just because you're, you know, a couple miles away. We're not really right. separate. We're part of the whole. So, but that's another podcast. We'll do with that. Yeah. another day. <laughs> so I want to get back to the education piece for a moment. Yeah. Things have changed. And for our viewers watching, this is reported pre-election. When we started the podcast, it was the start of COVID, we thought it'd be over by season two, but here we are still in the yeah. midst of it. Uh, but with education changing the way that it has, it is most uh, impactful on those that are underprivileged. And so how is Teach for America dealing with that specific issue? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, our teachers teach in our most at-risk schools. So they're teaching in Title I schools. Um, and the way that we, you know, we train our teachers and we've had to really kind of shift how we train them. So we not only are training them on how to now like um, de deliver impactful lessons that are engaging virtually. So that's one thing, right? Like how do we keep our kids' attention? I mean, I have three kids. My fifth grader, it's, an, it's, an, it's a consistent like check-in to make sure he's staying focused. It's hard. I mean, I'm a grown-up. It's hard to stay focused on Zoom calls all day long, right? You can yeah, imagine I, I am too. Being, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it's like... When you're 10, you're like, man, this is boring, right? And so we're really working with them on how to how to ensure that 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 their quality of lessons and teaching and instruction is just as high quality as it was in the classroom. So that's one thing. The other thing that we know and that we have identified is that trauma is one of the the key factors in um, that will be affecting our students ability to achieve academically. Yeah. And we already know that children who live in poverty deal with daily traumas that affect them consistently. So when you're waking up and you don't know where your next meal is coming from, right? Or if you're waking up and there's no structure at home because mom is working several jobs or mom and dad are working several jobs, there's all of these daily traumas that children who live in poverty deal with every day. Those school represents so much more for children who live in poverty than just a teacher and a book. It represents meals. It represents a safe haven quite often. It represents consistency, someone who they can talk to on a regular basis. And so when COVID hit, all of those things that school um, represents for kids who live in poverty was pulled from yeah. them, which is why we saw our school district right away, like try to make sure that we can still feed kids, right? Which was something I think so many people were like, what do you mean feed kids? Because there are kids who rely on school for breakfast and lunch, right? Like that is how they get fed. And so our teachers, we know, often are, are a confidant to our kids, right? Are uh, someone who, is, who, who sees them, who they always know is going to be there. So we are working really hard to not only train our teachers to provide exceptional instruction virtually, but also to be able to identify red flags, um, identify when a child might, might be having a hard time. So we're doing a lot of um, training in just like mental health awareness, not only 
require teachers to recognize when their students may need something or may need just more time with them or more guidance, but also for our teachers, understanding that teaching is already very, very stressful. And now we are asking our, our teachers to do this pivot, teach virtually, try to figure all of this stuff out while they are human and dealing with the same uh, anxieties that we all are about when is this going to be over? When are we going to go back to normal? What is going to happen? They have their own kids. I mean, we have teachers who are teaching and their kids are on virtual school right next to them. Yeah, so, I just got a menu on this teaching in and of itself is stressful. My grandmother was a middle school teacher and she loved it. Now, don't get me wrong. She, it, it was great and she was fantastic at it. But there was a different grandma when she was out of school and she was always looking forward to the breaks. And she would tease me and say, you kids think the breaks are for you. No, the breaks are for the teacher. Right, absolutely. <laughs> and so, is. listen, I worked at a charter school for one year and it was fulfilling. But I got to tell you, I was like, I have so much more respect for educators because it is a eat, live, breathe job. It is 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. It is weekends. It is, you know, this, and, and again, our teachers, they are putting in this incredible work. So, so we're focusing not only on the emotional resilience of our students, but our teachers as well, because we that. know that. Um, burnout is the number one reason why teachers leave. Teacher turnover is as high, and we know that burnout is the number one reason. And what so, does the landscape look like here in Las Vegas for teachers? Are we are we good, or do we need more? What's it look like? So, uh, and I don't quote me, but what I do know is that we do have a teacher shortage. I do not know what that number is at this point. I know years ago, I want to say it was like we we're missing like 800 teachers or something, but I don't know if it's that, um, if it's that intense right now, I have colleagues who know exactly what that is, who could tell you, I don't know that, but. Well, it's fine, but, the picture is good, but a shortage, what does that mean? Shortage. So a shortage means like, it's harder and harder to find, to find, I think people who want to go in the teaching profession. I think just as we are talking about, right, it's stressful. Um, it, it, I don't, the pay is not always great, right? I mean, there's all of these factors. And when we're talking about quality of life, things harder and harder to find people who are like, that's what I want to do. I want to teach. And so, um, so TFA, again, uniquely is positioned to fill in um, that teacher gap, right? And so we have like 175 teachers right now teaching within CCSD or at charter schools. And so we are literally, we work with CCSC to say, okay, we have brought these teachers here. Um, where can we place them? Where do you need them? And so we work with our partner schools to say, what kind of, you know, do you need a special ed teacher or a gym teacher or a science teacher? And we can recruit for that and we can actually help offset some of that teacher shortage. And so that's a, 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 another beautiful thing about TFA is that we really can help our school district by offsetting some of those shortages that that they they have. Again, I think that systematically we have a system that probably needs to shift in terms of like what do we value, right? Like who do we value? What do we value? What are we? Um, so I don't know CCSD's um, salary range uh, per se, but I do know that just across the board, not only here but throughout the United States, teachers are historically not paid as well as some other professions. The reality is these are people in my perspective, a teacher is a basic need. So, you know, people talk about basic needs being food, clothing, shelter. Absolutely. I also believe that a teacher is a basic need. We don't have people who are going to educate our future leaders. Then we don't have future leaders, like period. Brittany, you know, that is so and good. Teachers are a basic need. A basic need. They absolutely are. And that's part of my work is to try to explain that to people and to and to educate people on why that that is. And I mean, here's the thing. I think. For me, as a parent, uh, having my kids at home virtually, like doing school virtually has shown me even more how much a teacher is a basic need, because I'll tell you something, I'm not going to do it like. I watch it and I'm like, yeah, like I'm just thinking that there's someone on the other end of the computer 
You know what I mean? And I have to step in much more now and help um, navigate with them. Uh, you think but this will be more involved now when when things go back to normal. Now that they've had this experience where they have to help virtually and understand a bit more how intense it is to be a teacher, do you think they'll be uh, more likely to partner with teachers and volunteer a bit more? Or you know, I hope so. I. You know, I, I had a conversation with my son's teacher the other day and it made me a little sad because I did ask her, I said, how are you doing? You know, and, and she said, you know, people are frustrated and we have parents who are wonderful and understanding and, you know, all that stuff. And then we have um, parents who are just frustrated and their frustrations come out towards us, which as humans, that's what we do. Like we project our frustrations on whatever it is that, you know, is in our space. Okay. So, um, but in my perspective, does no good unless you want to be a homeschool teacher, like as a parent, um, it does no good to come down on on our teachers. I don't think it's realistic at this point to think that the virtual learning space is going to be perfect. This is something that we've never done before and we're doing it at this mass scale. So to have the expectation that like, it's gotta be perfect and all this stuff. I just give our teachers so much grace. My hope is that, um, yeah, is that when things go back to normal teachers will, or parents will be more inclined to have that partnership. I have to have an even, I have always had a great partnership, especially with my, my son's teachers. Cause he needs much more direction than my girls. They're like doing their thing, whatever. And my son's like, he's just like this free spirit, like, you know, school very much like I was actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so, um, but I've had to have an even greater partnership with them even now because he's not in the classroom. He doesn't have that face to face that one-on-one time. And so I will tell them like, message me if he missed an assignment or didn't do well on a quiz, I need to understand why. And, and I also think teachers have been incredibly flexible. I, I just honestly, like it's not perfect. And I, but I never expected it to be perfect. I expected it to be um, as good as they can do while they are literally building a plane as it's flying. I think and that's an important point to emphasize. And I had a, a mini aha moment when you yes. said we're doing this at mass. This virtual learning, traditionally you would try a pilot. I launch programs for my nonprofit where we'll pick a location or two to try it out, to perfect it, to figure out what's going to go wrong. And in this instance, the entire, literally the entire world had to shift all at once. There were no best practices you could look at to do this scale of change this quickly. So I think that we should definitely commend how well of a job uh, has been done. So I think so too. And, and, you know, so I, I talk to lots of parents and some of them are very frustrated and I just tell them, listen, I, you know, I, everyone is in the same situation. Nobody is, this is not you know, something where like, I I don't think, I don't know one person, whether they still have a job and they're thriving uh, or they've lost everything who has not been affected in some way by what's going on. And so if, again, that goes back to like that commonality, that point of like connectivity, like we're not all that, that different. It may look different from the external space, right? But the reality is we're all dealing with the same um, challenges just in maybe in different ways at different levels at different, you know, uh, but, um, yeah, I just, I commend them for, you know, they jumped to it. Listen, my son's school, when everything happened last or it was this year, it feels like last year, this year, last school year, they were back online in a week. And I thought that was like very impressive. I was like, wow. I mean, they had figured it out. They had, so for me, I was like, great. That's, you know, and again, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't, you know, everything that, you know, I, whatever in my perfect world, but he was learning and, you know, that was good for me. Yeah. And I, I think that that is what people need to really embrace and hold on to. Earlier in the conversation, you mentioned trauma. Yeah. and impact that that can have on a student's ability to learn. Mm-hmm. Can we dive a little bit more into that as we shift the conversation into your experiences with trauma? Absolutely. So trauma, uh, 
you know, I'm actually studying right now a lot about trauma. Um, so speaking personally, I um, have post-traumatic stress syndromes so of PTSD and um, disorder. And I have it because I was in an abusive relationship from uh, 18 to 20. And um, which really is what led me to the work that I do. And we can get into that. But um, what's interesting is that only fairly recently has my trauma from that relationship and what I experienced started to show up. This is 20 years later, right? My daughter is almost 18. So 18 years later, like I left when she was a, a week old. So, um, the trauma show is showing up and it shows up for me physically. So I have motor tics that I have developed and I started to get all this testing and someone thought I had epilepsy. And so they put me on this medication and the medication was terrible. So I got off the medication. I got a second opinion. And ultimately the diagnosis is it's motor tics, uh, caused by, um, unresolved trauma. And I was just fascinated by that because I'm a fully functioning human. I've been doing my life. You know what I mean? Like I'm successful to a point. I have a great family. I'm doing, not that I don't have my challenges, but as we all do, but a pretty full, amazing life. And I'm here thinking I'm like doing my thing over here. And it's the trauma is still ingrained in me. It is rooted. And what I've started to really, I'm in school. And so what I've started to really learn about is kind of how our brains work and the connections that all of our, you know, brains and all that stuff have, and that we create data points. So when we experience traumatic things, it creates this data point in our head, right? In our brain. And then when anything happens in our life that remotely resembles something that happened within that space, we pull from that and we create our own reality. And the reality, and the reality is that it creates this false reality. Like what's actually happening is not, is not that, but our brain is like, oh, I'm going to protect you. This is what's happening. And I'm going to, right. And then as we do that, it actually creates really unhealthy, um, uh, behavior habits because we start to react to things as if we are in this situation that we were in 20 years ago. Right. So for me, my trauma has shown up physically. It's also shown up. Um, and I'm being very honest in my, my, my marriage, because anytime we have a fight or I feel like we're going to have a fight, my brain pulls from 20 years ago and goes, Oh, I got to protect myself. Mm -hmm. And I put up this guard and my reaction. Yes. Yes. And so I go, and my reaction is normally not necessarily in alignment with what's actually happening. Right. And so now it's up to me to do that work to like take a step back and recognize when I'm doing that and start to like shift that. And that's a lot of work because our brains do it in a minute and our brains are obviously strong. That's what guides us. So, you know, trauma Trauma stays with you. This is the thing about trauma. It stays with you forever unless you address it. And even when you address it, I think, I think you become better at managing it. Does it ever go away? I don't know. Um, and so when we talk about, yeah, when we talk about young children, again, I, I always think about like a five-year-old who is dealing with severe trauma or, you know, who's in a home that's abusive. And that they are not even emotionally equipped to understand what's happening to them, right? And and I was 18 years old and I was in a very abusive relationship. I understood what was happening to me. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of complexities that go into abusive relationships and why you say and all of that stuff, right? But How did you get there? How did you get into that relationship to begin with? Uh, I mean, I was, what, 18 years old, so senior in high school. Uh, I knew him from my, my hometown, which is new in New Jersey. And, um, Were you similar he, in age or was he older? Uh, yeah, he's like, he was like maybe two years older than me, a year and a half older than me, but he was a friend of my best friend. So I grew up in Jersey and there were a few families where we were all very tight knit. And one of the families, my best friend, uh, was really good friends with him. So he was like connected by, by, by proxy. Right. So I had met him a few times. I didn't spend a lot of time with him, but I knew of him. Uh, and so, you know, I was living, we moved here when I was, um, 
16 and a half, almost 17. I was a junior in high school. So my senior year comes, my best friend comes out for my senior prom, which was kind of our deal. Like, if I don't have a date, you're going to come with me, whatever. And my best friend here didn't have a date. And so he brought him with him to my, to come and be my friend's date for our senior prom. And they stayed for like a week. And within that week, you know, I was very, yeah, we fell in love and whatever. And all, you know, all that stuff. Love, it's instant, Of course, yeah. And it's, you know, um, and then, um, you know, he went back to Jersey and very quickly was planning to move out here to be with me. It was a very like, and um, so he did. And there were a lot of red flags prior to him moving here. I think, you know, when you're young, And, um, if there's any sense of like you, um, you know, I think most young people have some kind of self-esteem, something going on, right. We're all searching for something. We're trying to figure out who we are, all of that kind of stuff. And I was in that place, right. Just wanting to be loved, just wanting to be cared for, just wanting to be beautiful and, you know, sexy and all that stuff. That's what, um, I actually think like society tells us that. And that's like my whole other philosophy, like really society tells us what we're supposed to be and like we buy into this and so Mm -hmm. at that time I had bought into to that and so you know he was very controlling at first even when he wasn't here super controlling uh, not always nice I didn't have any experience with it with anything like that and so in reality I didn't really even know I don't even think I identified it as that you know I did not have experience with anyone who was abusive or control I I never really experienced that so um, I think I was naive to what that looked like, right? I just thought like, oh, he's just in a bad mood or, oh, he just loves me. I, I don't know. Then he came here and the physical stuff started probably within like a, two months of him being here. So he was first verbal and emotional. Verbal, emotional, which is normally uh, how it's, I, almost, I, want, I, I don't want to say normally, but in a lot of, what I always try to explain to people is that like the physical abuse is almost like the after effect. Like, it's not even the worst of it in my perspective. The physical stuff is almost like, uh, that's just like, I almost separate it because the mental and emotional abuse is what breaks you down to the point where you accept the physical abuse. Mm-hmm. So by the time the physical abuse started for, for me, I believe that that's what I deserve. You know, I, I did the first time, the first time he hit me, I tried to break up with him. And I did. Well, I broke up with him and then he broke into my house and was hiding behind my, my door and um, let me know very clearly that was not OK. And so, you know, then I just breaking up, of, up with him was not OK. Yes. I mean, it was very clear that was not an option. Wow. Yeah. So what did you do next? So I just was in the I was OK. Are you going to change? Are you going to you know, it's the. What can we do to make it work? How can I help you? I, I'm going to fix him. If he loves me enough, he'll change. Like all of that stuff that we, we do um, to justify whatever. And so, um, yeah, so the relationship just went on and on and on. And the physical abuse got worse. The control, it was very control. I mean, it's to the point where, you know, I would show up sometimes in an outfit and if he didn't like it, he'd take, rip it off me. I mean, it was very, uh, very violent. and um emotionally mentally abusive and then i got pregnant um with my daughter and i was in my freshman year of college um and i'll be honest i was not going to have her and she she knows this i was driving to an appointment to terminate the pregnancy and the um the doctor's office called and told me that the doctor had an emergency and I uh, needed to reschedule my appointment. And I took that as my sign from the universe or God or whoever you uh, believe in. And I decided to have her. And I'll tell you the best choice of my freaking life because she's uh, she'll be 18 in February and is the most brilliant, beautiful soul. She just, and I, I don't know if I really had this talk with her, but at some point I will let, she saved my life. Mm. When I had her, um, I was still with him, um, but it was very clear to me that I had to, had to leave. Like it, it, it was no longer about me. It was about this child that I had that I was now responsible for and what I wanted her to grow up in, what kind of environment that I want her to grow up in, 
what did I want her to see and believe love looks like? Had the physical abuse stopped during your pregnancy? No, 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 no. And I mean, it was um, all the way through, even while, while I was in labor, there were all kinds of things that were happening. And then um, I had her, you know, brought her home. And then I did want to leave. I said, I'm ready to leave. I, I want to go stay with my parents. And that created more physical abuse because, you know, the most dangerous time in an abused woman's life is when she decides to leave because the power and control that is really at the center of the entire relationship uh, is threatened. Mm. And so the abuser reacts to that threat, like, you know, uh, that, that they're losing their handle on you. So and so they recognize you're getting a sense of power back. Right. And that's when they try to, to overly control or, yes. or exert their, yeah. their power at that time. Yeah. And that's when you see a lot of women, you know, I think, I don't know the stat today, but I want to say every three minutes a woman is murdered due to domestic violence. And normally you see that uh, sometimes, yeah, it's rage, it's whatever, but a lot of it is when they are making a choice to leave or they have tried to leave. Um, or, you know, um, and so, you know, and that was very true for him. I made a stand. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to go stay with my parents and, you know, kicked me in the head and all of these things. And so, um, so the, anyway, the next day I left, I, I, it's a long story, but I called my mom and he dropped me off at my parents' house for the afternoon. And I took my daughter and that was it. So he actually dropped you off and he did didn't expect anything or. Oh, yes. He was like, I'm going to call you in two hours. If you I mean, it was very. Yeah, it was like. So did he come back and try to, to take oh, you? Yes. Or? Okay. And no, because we had when I told my my parents, we packed up, we left. He did come back and break into the house. Um, and then we had him arrested and and all of those things. So, you know, I um, it's weird. I'm like sitting here on the screen and I've talked about this. Probably I've never really talked about this openly reported. I don't know where he is. Uh, I, I know he's alive, I believe. Um, I haven't talked to him in over whatever. So there was this point I was like, huh, should I be talking about this? Who knows? You know, because yeah, but yeah. Um, so he is out there. My daughter is about to be 18. I have done everything in my power in my life to protect her as much as possible without um, like not living a life. You know what I mean? Like it, it's very, it's very easy to, to allow trauma, fear, all of that to control you. And so I've worked really hard to, to try to live an open um, life as much as possible while being smart. And, um, you know, I just, yeah. So, but what led me to the nonprofit work was that experience because there was a time in a, in a, the Target parking lot, Boca Park parking lot. And um, he was yelling at me about something kind of pulling on my, my arm and people were walking by and just acting like they didn't see what was going on. And then this woman came up to me, to us, and she asked me if I needed help. And it was like super surreal because people never did that. And I kind of turned her, she had her kids with her and I was like, do I what? And she was like, do you need help? And I was totally shocked. She just like fixated on me and uh she just kept saying it over and over and then he was like yelling at her and you know this whole thing and, and i wasn't ready at that time so i said no i said thank you but no and she stood there a little bit longer and she asked me again like do you need help and i said no no i'm, I'm okay and um so after a while she walked away and i made a promise to myself at that moment that when i was ready to leave i would dedicate my life to being the person who asks do you need help mm. and that literally is so then i you know i had my daughter i went to college i got married and um, when I was about to finish college, I was like, man, what can I do to like help people? I didn't really even know about the nonprofit sector at that point. And um, I started doing some research and I was like, oh, there's this thing called nonprofit. And I had my degree in journalism and communications and I was doing some PR work and I was like, maybe I can. And um, my first job was at Safe Nest. Wow. So helping was your way of healing in a sense. Absolutely. And I think for me, when we talk about compassion, what happened to me was when I left, 
you know, I had to go to court to get the restraining order and do all this stuff. And I had like freaking lawyer team from, you know, my dad just went out of control. I had like seven lawyers with me. I was like, okay, <laughs> I don't even know if they were the right kind of lawyer. They just were there. Yeah. And, um, and I had to go though at family court. And I, I don't know what the office was, to be honest with you. I just remember going in there and I had to talk to someone. I want to believe it was like a social worker or a psychologist or something. And I went into this room and I had like this entourage of people waiting for me outside. And um, there were all of these women in, in there with their kids, with nobody, like not one person with them. And that I kept looking around going, so who do these women have? Who is their support system? Where is their entourage of people who are sitting outside for me? There was nobody there for them. And that was where my compassion, it like it kicked in because I went, I understood where they were, you know, because I was there too. I just had a whole different situation. I had a whole family to fall back on. I had a whole like support system to make sure that I was okay, to make sure that my daughter was okay, to make sure that we were okay financially. It's just so rare. And I realized very quickly how rare that is. And I said, I want to do something about that. This is not okay that, that women have to flee and then have nowhere to go or flee and have no financial means or flee and have to worry about how they're going to keep their kids safe. Like they should be surrounded by a support system, whether it's their family or it's a safe nest, right? Or it's yeah. a shade tree. And that was what kicked me into gear to figure out the work that I was going to do. Let me ask you this. When you were in the midst of the relationship and you thought, I can fix him, you know, I can help him, he'll, he'll stop, I can love him because he loves me, that kind of thing. Did you feel as though that was compassion at that time? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I think I had a lot of compassion for him. You know, he came from a, a tough, you know, childhood. Like, he didn't... You know, I think he was exposed to things at a young age that he probably shouldn't have been, right? I think that there were things that happened in his life that created a lot of, you know, he was, I, I think mental health had, had a lot to, 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 to do with a lot of what happened. And so again, like, I did have a lot of compassion for him and, and I still do. I, I think I've learned in life that you have to forgive to free yourself. Right. And so for years I was like holding on to like, fuck him, fuck him, you know, sorry. But like, and then one day I just was like, I have compassion for him because I don't think it's easy to be, for you to be someone who abuses someone, you have to have a lot of pain, I think, internally. There's got to be a lot of pain going on in, internally. And so I had compassion for him then. I have compassion for him now. Um, I, you know, doesn't mean it's going to be in my life, but I have compassion, you know, because I understood a little bit about what created that within him. Finish this sentence for me. Yeah. I feel compassion most when. I feel compassion most when I'm in alignment, mind, body, and soul. I feel love sense? when. Um, I feel loved when I am able to be my most authentic self. The purpose of compassion is? The purpose of compassion is love and acceptance. The reason we need compassion is? The reason we need compassion is because people need help. And, and people need to know that they're not alone. And people, human beings need to know that this journey that we're all walking can be both painful and beautiful, both joyful and sad, both all of these things. Uh, and I think if we as human beings can show compassion to each other, we can also show people like what their life can be outside of whatever they're going through when it's hard. What would you say to that 18-year-old Brittany 
that just met this, what she views as incredible man, and she's so in love, and he hits her, what would you say to her immediately after that? It's a good question. Um, I would, first I would, you know, in my head, I think I'd say like leave, but I didn't leave. And I have this beautiful daughter from this very ugly situation. So um, what I would say is that it's actually a tattoo that I have. And it says, hang on, it gets easier. And then it gets okay. And then it feels like freedom. And so that's what I would say to her. Yeah. I think we can leave it there. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Brittany, thank you so much for being on the podcast and for thank your transparency you. and just openness. I'm so grateful to, to hear this story and see where you are now. I think that that piece of it for me hearing some of the background to get you where you are i know we didn't really get into how many years you've been in nonprofit and some of the other things you've done but um your work with teach for america i think is the most important thing anyone can be doing right now because it's investing in our future so i just want to extend my gratitude to you thank you i'm so grateful that this happened and um yeah thank you what a great talk